Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kent Oliver, and it is my privilege to be a senior fellow with ALA's Public Policy and Advocacy Office, working with the Policy Corps in support of Unite Against Book Bans. And today we are help, here to help provide a little bit of perspective uh, about what UABB is doing and the context in which we are seeing book challenges and censorship around the country and what ALA's Policy Corps is doing to help you advocate against these book bans. But before our panel digs into uh, some, quest some questions uh, that I'll be posing to them in a little bit, I'd like for you to think about a few questions uh, as we go through uh, today. First of all, I know that all of you on this call are concerned about the book challenges and the threats we are seeing to our freedom to read. But how many of you have actually been on the receiving end of serious book challenges in your library, your community, or how many of you have seen your library resources, including your budgetary resources, threatened, your board members attacked, and you as library staff or as a library director threatened both personally and physically? How many of you are wondering what ALA is doing to protect you and to support you in these efforts uh, to fight book bans. And importantly, before today, how many of you have heard of Unite Against Book Bans and or have been on the website? And hopefully all of you have already joined. Okay, I'd like to introduce uh, our, uh, our panel members from Policy Corps that are going to be joining us today. We have Sonia Durney, who's with us from the University of New England. Jamie Gregory from South Carolina, and Mary Pelincano, who is a retired school librarian and importantly a library board member in Maryland, and myself, again, the senior fellow with ALA PPA. And uh, we included a, a little bit of a cartoon with this. You might see here that the librarian is, is uh, speaking to the dog, dogs and cat. The library rejected your request to ban all books on cats and squirrels, but to be fair, it was no dumber than all the other book ban requests we got. Okay. So, ALA's Policy Corps aims to expand our capability, ALA's capability, to advocate on key policy issues on behalf of the library community. And the core builds on the policy revolution initiative that was launched uh, by former ALA President Jim Neal from 2017 to 2018. And participants in the core focus on key issues that are important to libraries and librarians. And the cadre that is working with uh, Unite Against Book Bands numbers about 25, and this number continues to expand and the members that join this are selected and recruited, and they're certainly dedicated to what we are doing in this space. The purpose of the cadre is to develop and implement a strategic plan of advocacy, leveraging members of the policy core, as we are focused on countering the proliferation of book bans and book challenges in the United States. And what we were trying to do is not only influence librarians and provide them advocacy tips, but also influence public opinion and governmental decision making. We want to support local libraries and librarians and reinforce library values around the freedom to read and the constitutional protections that we all should be enjoying. But the focus of the work is really on the idea that we need to spread the word about the danger of book bans and book challenges. And we want folks, not just librarians, but members of the community to sign up for Unite Against Book Bans. Okay. I'm going to hope that all of you on this webinar are familiar with Unite Against Book Bans, but the focus is that it's really the public facing umbrella that we have that is a national initiative that empowers readers everywhere to stand together in the fight against censorship. We know through all surveys that the majority of the American public does not support book bans. And what we are trying to do is provide a voice for those people. 
And the important thing that you will see on this particular website, when hopefully you will go there, uniteagainstbookbans.org, is the fact that ALA is not alone, librarians are not alone, but we have many collaborations that exist and are represented within the space. Okay. This is one of my favorite slides uh, that we provide when we're talking about book bans and book challenges. I know you've heard that ALA and the American public is experiencing a culture war generated by our, new, our political partisanship and societal differences that we see in the country today. We are in a nation that is literally divided over important issues in K through 12 education, including which books should, students should be able to read. Uh, this is spilled over into public libraries and academic libraries as well. There's opposition to materials on subjects that range from sexual conduct, LGBTQIA+, an emphasis on social justice, critical race theory, anti-police, to using racial slurs, anti-Semitism, and promoting a religious viewpoint. So if you would just take a second to look at this slide and see what's represented on this slide. If you're a librarian looking at it, you know that if your collection were to suddenly not have any books or materials that deal with the subjects that are represented here, if you didn't, if you had any collection at all, it would be a very vanilla one and a very uninteresting one. I also think it's important to consider when you're looking at this slide, the idea that as we talk about a culture war in this country, the books really are not the, not the targets necessarily of what we are experiencing. The targets are the ideas that are represented on this slide. Okay. When we talk about censorship, the slide in front of you is a, a little bit older slide that represents the numbers we were seeing with book challenges over the last few years. You can see the trend was fairly basic, fairly flat until we got to 2021 and 2022. And what we were typically seeing during that time were individuals challenging, making book challenges, and oftentimes uh, very heartfelt challenges based upon their family values and, and what they were concerned about for their individual families. Okay. So the new 2023 data tells us that challenges are up dramatically. And if you look at the unique titles challenge, that's about a 40 to 50 percent, or pardon me, a much larger range from 2571 to 4240. And you'll see public library challenges there, total titles targeted, a percent of multiple title challenges that I was just referring to. Everything is on the increase. And what we know now is that what we are facing are book challenges in libraries that are not by individual parents or families or people in the community, but by organized groups that are attacking libraries. And they typically challenge uh, books 50 to 100 titles at a time, as opposed to a handful that their family might be concerned about. The other thing we know about these numbers is that about 30% of all book challenges are reported to ALA. And the reason we know this, we're not just guessing, is that through uh, FOIA requests and other surveys, we know that many uh, governmental entities do not report the book challenges that they are receiving to ALA. Okay. This screen represents what I call a heat map, but gives you an idea of where titles are being challenged in public schools and libraries throughout the country. The darker the uh, the state, the more book challenges have a, that have occurred there. You can see Texas and Florida stand out quite dramatically. Everybody is probably looking to find their state there. Okay. 
So along with this, we've seen state censorship legislation and regulation uh, attempts going up to uh, provide an atmosphere that does not support the freedom to read or your First Amendment rights. And we've seen state legislatures removing legal defenses to obscenity prosecution, putting bans on the acquisition or distribution of sexualized content, including LGBTQIA plus materials and authors, private rights of action, restriction on regulation of digital resources, use of administrative regulations to remove or restrict disfavored information, the erosion of minors' rights, access and privacy, and minors have First Amend have the First Amendment rights as well, and deprofessionalization of librarianship. Okay. Let's move on to the next slide. And in the area of policy attacks, we have the elim elimination of longstanding legal protections for librarians and educators, curriculum, materials, and program censorship, parental rights are being attacked, excessive filtering is coming on the table again, and again, the private rights of action with individuals taking action against boards because of what they consider to be objectionable material. I might bring your attention to this slide because there is a QR code on it that refers to our toolkits with UABB, and there is a lot of great advocacy and resource information on that particular website. Okay. So now we are we are to our panelists. I've given you a little basic information for you to think about. Um, but we have Jamie and Mary and Sonia with us today. And uh, I tell you, these folks are, are so knowledgeable. Uh, they've all been working in, in this space for over a year now. Uh, they've been researching, they've been training, they've been following trends, they've been out making presentations. Um, so I have a few questions for you guys, and uh, I'll warn you, Jamie, I'm going to let you take this one first, and then you can just kind of work around it uh, with the group. So you've been working in this space, and I'm going to say intentionally, for over a year now, is in the policy core cadre. And we actively interact with our colleagues and the public on a very regular basis. How do you view generally what is happening and prioritize the real threats that we are facing as librarians? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here. I'm excited to talk to everybody today. Um, it is difficult. Um, for school librarians in the South, especially to prioritize what's going on. And so what we're doing um, through our state organization of school librarians is we're making sure that we are partners with many other organizations in our state that are not generally made up of librarians, but also have goals of anti-censorship. And so we can support each other um, and often our goals overlap. So as you've said, it's not even always about specific titles being censored, it's the ideas in books and the very different types of people that make up our society and why we value that in America. And so that's why it's important for all of our organizations to come together, to work together and support each other because ultimately what happens in one profession can affect another, even if you might not think so at first. Um, so when we talk to each other, it's really important for us to not necessarily listen to what's being reported in the media, but go to the actual people themselves who are being affected and ask them, what is actually happening to you? What are the effects that you're seeing? What are the people in your organizations going through? Um, and that's one way to prioritize, to work together and share what's actually happening so then you can develop strategies from there.
And I'll let someone else answer too. Okay, Sonia. <laughs> okay. I'll go ahead and jump in. And I agree with what Jamie said. I think it's really about working together. Um, I'm also the president of the Maine Library Association. And last year here in Maine, we had a bill, LD123, which was one of those bills to criminalize anyone who works in a public school um, if they're providing obscene materials to students. And first, we all know librarians are not providing um, obscene materials to students. So that's full stop right there. But um, it was wonderful to work with other folks, um, being the Maine Library Association, we also have the Maine Association of School Libraries. So that was our first and most immediate partner. But then we also worked with the Maine Education Association, social workers, the ACLU. So getting all of those folks involved was really, really powerful. And it helped us figure out, you know, which threats we really needed to prioritize. And another um, benefit to that was that many of our organizations do not have a paid lobbyist. We frankly can't afford one as much as we'd love one, but some of these other organizations we collaborated with did have a paid lobbyist. And that person was really able to help us look at what was coming at us, how like they knew a lot of the behind the scenes conversations happening at the state house that we didn't have access to. So having this coalition in place was so powerful. Thankfully, that bill did not pass. Um, it was basically a copycat bill of another bill from 2019 that was almost the same with a little twist on it. So we'll see what they come back with next year, but it's really wonderful to know we have this team in place. We all have an email thread going. So whenever anything comes up around the topic of censorship, we have each other basically on speed dial and that makes the work so much easier. Uh, I'll echo what everybody else has said that, um, you know, this is part of a larger um, sowing of division, I think, in our country. And, um, you know, it's about ideas, um, not so much the books themselves, but the ideas and the people that are represented in the books. And at the end of the day, um, you know, it's people first. So we're not here to defend books. We're here to defend people and their right to self-expression. Uh, we have, we just had in Maryland a, Freedom to Read Act uh, bill passed, which is very helpful. But as a as 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 a library trustee, um, it's my job to make sure that our policies and our guidelines do support people and their right to read. So constantly reviewing them, making sure that our um, our 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 collections are accessible, our programming is appropriate and and open to all. And working with our um, elected officials to under to make sure that they understand that this is the law and this is what we are supporting in our libraries. Okay, that was Mary. That was the the perfect setup for for our next question here, and I'll let you uh, take it when I when we uh, get through it here. But you know what we're constantly hearing from librarians is how do we improve our policies. And specifically, we get a lot of questions about the collection development policies, uh, what we need to do to evolve those policies in the atmosphere that, that we're in right now. So what suggestions do you have for updating the collection development policy or any other apologies, uh, any other policies that uh, you might need, especially in this atmosphere where we're getting uh, people challenging books not a handful at a time, but 50 to 100 or more at a time from a national playbook? Well, like I said, as a, as a trustee, we are constantly, well, we should be constantly examining our policies. Um, with the Freedom to Read Act, um, now it's codified in law legislation, certain aspects of our collection development policy that must be met. Um, so reviewing that, making sure that they are um, published and enforced, um, keeping the Freedom to Read Act, uh, the Freedom to Read Statement by the ALA, and the um, Right to Read um, Library Bill of Rights, keeping them all front and center while we're developing these policies is very helpful and important. Uh, the request for a reconsideration policy should be examined so that uh, there are rules about who can who can submit a reconsideration request. Um, people with standing, you know, you have to have a library card. You have to have a child in the school district. 
You can only fill out one form per title that uh, you have to state who you represent if you're not an individual, if you're not representing yourself, if you're re representing an organization, you have to state that. The Miller test has should be, um, made, people should be made aware of what the criteria are for the, the, Miller, the Miller test. And that should be used as a framework to um, write a reconsideration policy. It should be front and foremost. And um, I think if you have those, um, those tools in place, if you have an ironclad policy that can be a level, you know, a layer of protection, and really um, you be used as a shield against some of these, uh, you know, reckless book bans of you know hundreds of titles. Jamie. I can add um, the collection development policy that I revised at my school actually states that individual complaints will first be forwarded to the division librarian so that we don't immediately jump to the head of the division, the head of the school for whatever equivalent you might have in your district or your county. Um, and um, the purpose of that is to build community so that um, you know, the members of my school community know that I, I'm an actual person and I work for the school, I work with students, and you can be in conversation with me at any point in time if you have concerns. And that's my role as an educator is to work with parents, and I'm more than happy to do that. Um, and also just hopefully having previously been in conversation with your school administrators so that A, they know that you have a policy and they know the purpose behind it um, so that if there does come to be a problem, they might be more willing to hopefully use the policy and not just, I don't want to deal with this problem. So we're just going to do whatever the parent says rather than review it, you know, not in an emotional state or as a knee jerk reaction. Um, so, you know, you would hope that some of those things being in place will help protect um, students' rights. And I also agree, definitely, hopefully, um, while enforcing the rule that one form needs to be filled out for each book, because if you're truly concerned about the actual book, um, then you would be willing to do that, I think. I would say plus one to everything Mary and Jamie mentioned. They're definitely the experts working in public and school libraries. I work in an academic library, and the advice I would offer would be to be proactive. So if you have it on your to-do list to update your policy, do it now. If you don't have a policy and you haven't had any challenges, write your policy now. Um, in higher ed, we're not really seeing book censorship issues. We are seeing um, free speech on campus issues, certainly, and um, oversight over what's being taught in the classroom that Fringe is definitely on censorship, but we're not seeing book censorship. But nonetheless, um, we went through our collection development policy and have a form for reconsideration just in case it happens. We are ready and we have our policy in place and it's clearly available on our website. And I'm reassured after hearing Mary and Jamie talk about what um, things to include in there that I feel we have a pretty good policy in place. So we're, we're ready if it happens. You know, you guys have talked a lot, a lot about some pretty important things here. And I think one of the, as a public library director, a previous public library director, I think one of the, the things to remember is you wanna be revising those collection of pol policies every year and looking at those. And um, you need to remember that your board of trustees, the Marys of your world are your, are your best friends. Um, and they're there to support the library and they need to make sure you need to make sure that they are trained and familiar with that collection development policy so that they can be your biggest support uh, when the sensor comes knocking. Another thing I would add, Kent, just to jump in on the collection mm -hmm. um, the reconsideration policy, it's important to make sure that those, uh, whatever resources are being challenged are to continue to be made available until the process is finished and, and a determination has been made. There, there's been quite a bit written about this issue, but I, you know, I think as you look at the time frames of the challenges and uh, requiring people to actually um, have read the book and some way to verify that, 
And also there's some libraries I know that are talking about charging a fee for book challenges because there is a cost involved with uh, with actually processing a book challenge. And especially when you get 50 to 100, and it's not out, I don't think it's inappropriate to limit the number of challenges the one person can turn in at a time. I think that's fair too. Okay, okay Sonia. You ready to talk a little bit about book resumes and what's going on with UABB website? Yes. So I am thrilled to see the book resumes published on the UABB website because it's a big time saver, right? For librarians who are having an issue with the title, we could each do the research on that title and what the benefits of the title are, what the merits are of the work what literary value it brings ourselves, but to have this in one place to start as a starting point is so helpful. Um, and reason I personally have been finding them very helpful is that at the Maine Library Association, when this um, book censorship wave came upon us in the early days, we made a pretty big misstep in defending a book challenge. There was a book that was challenged here in Maine. It was an anti-trans title and we, defended the library director's decision to keep the book on the shelf because it certainly, we don't take books off the shelf because we disagree with what's in them, right? 101, the book should stay on the shelf. But a sentence was added to our opposition letter stating that perhaps we wouldn't recommend this title for a collection. So difference, right? You were not saying the book shouldn't be on the shelf, but we did sort of walk it back slightly and say, but we wouldn't maybe recommend this book for purchase in general. The book had had bad reviews, had been cited for potential misinformation in it. So there were numerous reasons that as a purchaser for a library, if I read the reviews, I might not have purchased it. So we made the mistake of adding that sentence, uh, which really watered down our defense. Um, thankfully, the book stayed on the shelf. It still stayed on, it's still on the shelf in that library. So it was a great outcome for everything. But we learned a lot on the board about making sure that we don't get into the content of the book as much as a board. Uh, the school certainly can, the selector, but what's wonderful about the book resumes now is we have, you know, our discussion in our letter supporting or opposing, uh, um, sorry, excuse me, opposing the censorship of the book, but then we can add that in the appendix, like, and as an FYI, here are the merits of the book, but we really try to stay out of like the content of the book and whether our, the main library association approves of this content or not. That's not for us to say. What we're saying is we believe the books should stay on the shelf. So the um, book resumes are really helpful to have that there and we can add them right to our letters. I'm sure what do you think? What do you think, Jamie? So I am the upcoming president of the South Carolina Association of School Librarians, and we it is our position that we do not tell school libraries in our state what books they should have and what books they shouldn't have. So we never we never advocate or don't advocate specific titles because every school library should be different because every school library is in a different community in our state, which is wonderful. That should be something that we're actually excited about. Um, but so what we do advocate is that you, as a school, as a school district, you have a collection policy that you have collaborated with other administrators on who are your stakeholders. So you've built that relationship. And so that if they don't have a background in library science, which they probably don't, they'll understand when you defend intellectual freedom, what that actually means, what that's going to look like in your school. Um, the idea that you know, checking out books of a, from a school library is not compulsory. You know, you are have freedom of choice in that and why that's a good thing and how that's part of your First Amendment rights. Um, so that's why the book resumes are so important. So that if individual school librarians, and they are finding themselves in the middle of tons of book challenges, there are resources to help them. They have book reviews at their fingertips to show why, okay, maybe an individual parent, that book is not what they want their child to read, but that does not make it inappropriate or even harmful for children and teens as a whole, um, which is the conversation that we're trying to have. And those who want to have that conversation in good faith, those are actually fantastic conversations because we can finally share all of our professional knowledge. 
Um, and so again, that's really, it's harder to do that when you're, you feel by yourself um, and you're being attacked and you have all of this going on. You're afraid for your job. You might be afraid for your personal safety. Political people are attacking you on social media. You have a place to turn to that can give you professional information that will help you. And I agree with all of the, uh, what my colleagues have said. Um, you know, not every book in the library is for everyone, but there should be something for everyone in the library. And the book resumes, I think, are a good tool, um, not only for us as librarians, but also for the public to see that, you know, these books are not in, in fact pornography and that they do have literary value. And there's also a benefit, I think, to um, shedding some daylight on what it is we're supposedly peddling, <laughs> um, that these are legitimate books, they have value, and um, there's that layer of transparency that we can offer to show people, this is what we have, this is why we're sharing them with our constituents. So I think in that way, it's um, it's benefit beneficial on lots of levels. It's a, it's a great tool, I encourage everyone to take a look at them. I do as well. I do as well. You know, you guys are making a lot of important points as we go through this. And a couple of you have mentioned librarians and libraries do not carry what is legally obscene. It, it just isn't out there. And th the fact that they are accused of that, and that's why it's so important that we have these book resumes as a tool uh, so that we have uh, something documented so as these groups go around the country challenging us we're not recreating the wheel and how many thousands of libraries okay uabb was established uh has established partnerships with organizations across the country and uh, we are working, uh, who are working to support intellectual freedom. And I hope representatives from those folks are on this call today. I believe they are. Um, but how can we, uh, as local advocates, leverage the partnerships in our local communities that support our work? Anybody want to jump in on this? I can jump in on that. Um... As a the, the board of trustees is your is should be first and foremost the biggest advocate in your community for the library system. I mean that's our primary job. Um, we can cultivate relationships through different channels, uh, school systems, chambers of com commerce, the business community, um, developing relationships with our elected officials. These are all ways that we can grow the library, um, grow the library's presence and um, reputation in the in the community. So that there's that very strong su uh, support among our constituents so that when the book challenge does come into our neighborhood, um, we are prepared with, with um, strong allies and advocates in our community. Um, I think that that's uh, a great place to start, and I think it's an important role that um, directors and trustees have, particularly with um, relationships with our elected officials. Um, they are the ones that hold the purse strings, and they're the ones who people go to when they have a problem. Inviting our uh, council members into the library, going for legislative day on uh, to, to the state capitol, lobbying for legislation, lobbying for rules, asking for money, and then thanking people when they give us the money and the support, showing up in good times and in bad. I think those are really, it's it's, it's important to have that front-facing um, piece of the library out there uh, in good times and in bad. I think being able to work with the United United Against Book Band Partners is critical. Um, it's wonderful if you look at the page to see the diversity of organizations that are listed there. I recently was on a radio show here in Maine, Maine Calling, and we did an episode on book censorship. And we were talking about um, having a few folks call in and who could bring some different perspective. 
And uh, one of our last in-person policy core meetings, we had heard from the Interfaith Alliance, which is a national um, organization that brings together different faiths. And I found it fascinating to hear from that group how they are against book bans also. Um, there's such a um, myth out there that it's religious folks that are behind these book bans, but um, this group actually sees it as a slippery slope to religious persecution and censorship also. And they've written some great work, um, Banned Books, Banned Beliefs, which is on the UABB website. I highly encourage you to check that out if you haven't read it. So I was able to reach out to them since they are a known partner and someone from that group called into the talk show. And I got numerous comments from folks after who had listened to it saying how eye-opening that was and how reassuring it was to them in so many different ways. People had who had grown up in a church or um, you know, are religious themselves, like, yes, I, I don't support book censorship either, but I think um, just having that out there and clear as day is so helpful. And I, I would add, I can, I think it's really important okay. to have um, a place where you can have one message come from. So when you're working with a variety of organizations who maybe, you know, they don't have the library background, they know, you know, kind of our terminology and where we're coming from and our foundational ethics. So having the materials is just so helpful for that reason too. I would okay. encourage folks too to reach out to local organizations and try to get more folks to sign on as partners. I'm um, on the board of the Maine Freedom of Information Coalition, and their primary, our primary um, directive is to make sure government information is not censored in any way, shape, or form. So books is a little bit outside of their scope, but the board voted to become a member unanimously right away. There was no discussion, like everyone just felt it was really the right thing to do. So, you know, if there's organizations in your community who you think could get involved and that's with an alignment with their mission, it's worth reaching out to them and connecting them with the Unite Against Book Bans folks. And to, to, to jump on that too, events, you know, are coming up on Pride Month or coming up on Juneteenth. If there are events in your neighborhood, you know, making sure that the library is out there front and center as a, as not only to garner advocacy, but also to be an advocate and an ally for other folks too. So working both ways. Okay. I'm gonna to go to the next question here in a minute. Obviously we have had some questions prepared. And I am aware of the questions piling up in the Q and A, and we will be leaving some time to to get to those when when we com complete uh, complete this round here. But you know, this was another legislative uh, season that we just saw at the state level and local levels, and we saw a lot of anti freedom to read bills uh, in the state legislatures that, frankly, were a little bit mind numbing uh, in many in many states. And we know that 2024 is an election year. Uh, in fact, uh, ALA has a new uh, uh, initiative called Reader Voter Ready that I'd invite everybody to look at. Um, but uh, as, into, as libraries, as an association ALA, uh, we cannot uh, advocate on specific issues or advocate for specific candidates. Um, but what should we be doing to fight censorship as individual librarians? Uh, you know, a lot of our institutions have policies around that. Again, who should we be collaborating with? And, you know, how can frontline staff, how can that CERC clerk or that reference librarian uh, staff member advocate for our issues, which I think is so critical this year? Jamie, you want to go after that? Sure, we are right in the middle of this, of course, in South Carolina. Um, we are anticipating a new regulation is going to be passed from our State Board of Education. Um, and so it's a very important question that you asked, especially in South Carolina for public school librarians. Um, and so I think the answer is that we don't I, we don't care which political party is part of the unjust censorship. It's whoever it is, whatever party they are, 
we are always going to defend our students' intellectual freedom rights. And, you know, our state superintendent of education has openly said students don't have academic freedom. And she's she's wrong. Um, we know the law is on our side and they have constitutional rights even when they walk on the school campus. Um, and again, that belongs to no political party. Um, and so this is where your partnerships are very important because you can educate people on the foundation of First Amendment rights in public schools. Um, and there are so many people who are able to advocate for you with particular politicians. Um, seeking out your allies, who is going to support you, more importantly, who's gonna support your students. But also, you know, we're trying to avoid school librarians losing their professional teaching licenses or certificates because of book challenges if they go in front of our state board. Um, you know, I, I, we, we're not, we don't have the kind of legislation that would um, put public school librarians in jail or find them, but that certainly has not been the case everywhere in our country. Um, so again, it's not that we are not focusing on a particular political party. Whoever is trying to unconstitutionally restrict our students' rights and our own, that directly falls in our line of work. And so we work to educate the public about why we do what we do, that we have rights and that students have rights and that that's not a form of indoctrination. Those are just the rights that they enjoy when they live every day in this country by the constitution. We, we believe that every day we live here. Um, so I think that's really important. And the people who are in favor of censoring books, they gaslight us continually and they misrepresent us on purpose, but we stick with our message because we are following the law, we are protecting our students' rights, and again, it doesn't matter what political party you're part of to do that. I agree, 100%. Um, I just read somewhere that librarianship stands at the crossroads of public service and politics. Um, we know that we're, we, are, we are unbiased and we are neutral, um, but the fact of the matter is that politics comes into every aspect of our lives and it's a fine line that we have to walk, but knowing the political climate of our community, I think is very helpful and keeping the message that we're promoting first amendment rights. We're not promoting any particular book or any particular kind of book or programming, but we are, that's something we can, everyone can get behind. Like, like um, Jamie said, we're all, in favor of the constitution, theoretically. I think also importantly, it's we should avoid self-censorship. That's a, that's an issue that we've seen in our in our, our profession a lot. And you know, I, I un, rightly so, I not rightly so, but understandably so, because it's a scary time, you know, and people are afraid of their jobs, people are afraid of being threatened. So in order to avoid controversy, sometimes we will just not put the books on the shelf if we think it might attract some controversy. I think it's really important that we understand what our, what our role is and how it, it re foundational to democracy and that we should be unafraid. You know, we should be out there. We should speak up, again, not political, but just for the constitution that we all believe in and for the democracy that we're trying to hang on to. I'll jump in here too, and I agree with everything Jamie and Mary said, and I think I'll push the envelope a little bit further even. I could um, geek out about this topic all day, but I 100% think libraries need to be more political. We do not need to be part, we do not want to be partisan, but we can be more political. I think library workers can be more political, not partisan. I think there's a lot of chilling effects, as Mary mentioned, on us. Um, you know, there's a lot to consider. If I'm advocating, am I advocating as myself, Sonia, a citizen of Waterboro, Maine? As a, am I advocating as the president of the Maine Library Association? Am I an employee at the University of New England? So I really need to think about what hat I'm wearing when I'm reaching out and making sure that message is consistent. I think there's a lot of confusion, for instance, with public library workers around the Hatch Act, the Hatch Act, which limits the activities of library workers um, who are funded by the government. And this is really a big barrier 
But there's so many things you can do. You can encourage people to vote. You can have voter drives. You can have voter forums in your library. You just can't suggest people vote a certain way. We certainly don't want to do that, but you can educate. So much of advocacy is just education. There's a big difference between advocacy and straight up lobbying or being partisan. And it, um, I think people need to be really clear on that. Even on our own board, the Maine Library Association, we're a 501c3. And we had board members who thought we weren't allowed to lobby. We absolutely are allowed to lobby. It just cannot be a substantial part of our activity activities. And there's a calculator to figure that out. So there's not a lot of mystery there. Like we sh should be lobbying. We should be speaking up against these bills. Library workers should be talking about these issues and educating the community. So um, I think everything, anything we can do to make this clear, if you're a library director, have some information in your handbook. If you're a library worker and you're not clear what you can or can't do to speak up, talk to your director, get some feedback from folks. But the folks who are trying to censor books are very loud, and we know they're not the majority. We have poll after poll after poll that shows most citizens do not think censorship is the right thing. Most voters don't think uh, censorship is the right thing. Parents don't think this, but those folks are very loud, and we need to be loud also. That's right. Thanks, Sonia. Uh, very quickly, as I see our time is running here, I do want to point out, as we talk about legislation in states, many times those bills are actually uh, unconstitutional and are in violation of the First or Fourteenth Amendments. And so as you're thinking about your your state venues or your communities, be thinking about whether that's the case and whether those bills need to be challenged. Because the Freedom to Read Foundation and other organizations have a pretty good track record when it comes to opposing bills that are, are blatantly in violation of our First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. So I'm going to combine these last two questions because we want to get to the, the ones piling up in, in the Q&A here. Um, but obviously, you guys have been doing this now uh, for over a year. It goes fast. You've been doing it officially for over a year as part of Policy Corps. Um, so what is most frustrating to you uh, about the work that you've chosen? Anybody? I think that for me, the most frustrating thing about my job is that the general public um, is largely uninformed about it, exactly what it is we do. Um, I have, as we all do, plenty of stories about, oh, you know, you how do you choose books? You know, how do you just don't get donations and just put them on the shelves? I mean, just um, just a general misinformation about what it is we do, why we do it, how we do it, um, the level of education that we need, the level of training that we need. So I think that advocating for their, the professionalism in librarianship and educating folks on what uh, that professionalism entails uh, that we're highly skilled in book selection and community programming, and we are trained to identify the need for resources and remove barriers to equity for our particular community. So knowing the community is a big part of what we do as well. We're educated professionals who understand the importance of a well-informed electorate for a functioning democracy. I think, um, you know, it goes beyond just the keeper of the books, you know. It was never really about the books in the first place. It was always about the ideas that are represented in the books, and again, you know, supporting and defending people's First Amendment rights. Oh, I struggled with the mute button. Um, for me, it's just um, really disturbing human behavior that there are people in our local communities who are willing to stalk and just post disgusting things on social media, um, people, I've gone through this, I'm pretty sure Amanda Jones is on here. <laughs> She's gone through it. People who don't know you, who maybe don't even live in your community, willing to call your school to say that you should be fired, um, calling you a pedophile, accusing you of felonies, um, saying that you have this job because you want to harm children. Um, that's been really disturbing. That's um, That's been a lot. And so I know we try to remind ourselves that those people are in the minority, but as you all have already said, they are very vocal 
And all it takes is one person to believe that disinformation for your whole life to fall apart. And they want that. And the fact that they want that and don't care how that harms you. Um, so that, that's, that is frustrating in one word. I think, uh, Kent, your question was most what's most uh, frustrating about our career as a librarianship. So I would say misinformation broadly. Um, when we're speaking about book censorship, though, misinformation about book censorship, there's that narrative that we're trying to protect children or protect societal norms. When really what's happening when we're censoring books is we're suppressing div diverse voices and perspectives. So that's not we're not protecting children. We're actually shielding them from being able to understand these complex issues and understand so much about society in a better way. Um, so we're not protecting our children by censoring books. So what gives you hope? Sign you, I'll let you start. My colleagues, all, all of you, library workers, the folks here on the screen, the folks in the policy core, I'm at the Maine Library Association annual conference right now, and we just gave an award out to our library advocate of the year who spoke up so eloquently and loudly at a school board meeting, um, fighting to keep books on the shelves. Um, libra librarians give me hope. For me, it's young, young people I work with. Um, you know, they just, growing up with technology, they just, they know, the world and they know so many different types of people and they understand why that is what we need in society and that how that's part of the first amendment and the constitution and all of the things that we live by um and i really think it's part of who they are i agree 100 percent, jamie it's the young people they have a sensitivity to each other and a support for each other that is we can all learn from and we see that the Girl Scout in Hanover County and the, the kids in Caroline County who, who rejected efforts to censor their, what they were doing. So my hope lies in, the, in, this, in these youngsters and this next generation because you know, they're the ones that are being affected and they're the ones that are speaking up. So I think that's a really good sign. Well, I'm gonna jump in on this one. I think the fact that our colleagues are paying attention and uh, they're starting to advocate and fight against this. And why you mentioned earlier the fact that a lot of people aren't even aware that, that this is going on. My experience has been that as people become aware that it is going on, that they become engaged and concerned. And they they want to fight against it, and they're going to fight against it at the ballot box. So, well, I am going to go to some questions here. Um, and we have... And I'm just going to throw those out. And whoever wants to take those, would you might would you just jump in? Um, let's go here. And before I do that, we do have a number of resources on these screens. We have some ALA resources that are going to be showing up. And uh, we also have some great resources from some of our partners at UABB. And I do want to do a shout out to those partners that are on the call and that are on the website. Uh, this is this is an American issue. It's a democracy issue. So as we uh, as we talk about book bans and book challenges, we can't do it alone as librarians. And uh, we really uh, need to have everybody engaged. And so thank you for all those partners that have joined us. And we hope that you'll reach out to your colleagues and have them become part of Unite Against Book Bans. So the first question I had way back at 1230 was although library board members should be our friends, what do you do when a book banner has been appointed to the board? Anybody want to jump in on that? Well, I can speak a little bit about that. Um, that's been something that I've been looking into. Um, boards are selected in different ways in different places. When I was in Loudoun County, Virginia, it was a um, appointed, the, the library board of trustees was appointed um, by the local um, county council. And uh, in this, in Talbot County, Maryland, the library board appoints their own colleagues on the on the board. So uh, I, I think other places they might be elected. 
So um, I, I think it really depends on how the trustees are uh, appointed or get on the board, and then what this what the policy is to have them removed or what kind of vetting process is is involved. Um, since it's all over the map, I don't even really even know if there would be a process to challenge uh, an appointee of somebody in, inappropriate or the remover, removal of somebody from a board. So that, I think that's an area, that's a real gray area that I, I've started to do some research in, but I don't know, maybe somebody from ALA could hmm. jump in on that. I don't know the answer. Yeah, you know, I might go ahead and jump in on this one a little bit. And in fact, I have a friend who's experiencing the same issue, and I, I visit with, with, with that person on a regular basis. But this goes right back to our issue of advocating and voting. Uh, I think libraries were asleep for a long time, while boards and local county commissions were perhaps being uh, packed or at least being lined up to be uh, anti-reader in some regards. Uh, and become about power and control. And really our best bet, I think, in, in this area is that we need to, we do need to inform and educate our existing board members. We need to work with them as much as we can to uh, understand the dangers of censorship. We need to individually advocate for commissioners and board members uh, who can support us within reason within our positions. Uh, but it's a process, and it's not something that changes overnight, and you have to be able to work with the system in order to turn it around. Okay, the next question we had was very similar to that. It, it speaks to county commissioners who are appointing those folks. So, and ha ha how can you deal with folks who should be your biggest advocates who are the ones that are verbally abusing staff and pushing for censorship? Any other thoughts on that, Sonia? Anything? I think it touches on a lot of what we were talking about before, was laying the groundwork and helping people understand what libraries are really about, and and the rights that we have as individuals. And definitely having the support of the community, um, right? Being out there and um, making sure that your community is supportive of you and, and is an advocate for you. Okay, here's one. Can you talk about the work about specific divisions of ALA, such as ALS, YALSA, graphic novels, comic grounds, tables, et cetera, are doing to support this important work or how you worked with them? Um, I was just on the 2024 Prince Award Committee um, and we, all of the work that any of the ALA book award committees do embraces the values of diversity and representation. Um, and we do not select or deselect books based on our personal opinions or values, or on just the idea that a book could potentially be a problem. Um, that That's one area that we try when we talked about self-censorship. Self um, that we also want to encourage librarians not to fall into that. Um, you know, you don't, we don't do that mostly because if it's not something that's happened, then you don't create a problem where there isn't one. And if it's a book that ne needs to be in the collection or, you know, meets the criteria to win a book award, you know, you don't deselect it just because there might be a group of people who aren't going to like that book. Okay, this is an interesting question from Sharon. I have a question if there's time. How do we fight banning when it's coming from a superintendent who isn't following policy and he has the school board majority behind him? It feels hopeless. Well, we have it can be your friend there. Everybody Sorry. can wait on this one. I was going to jump in on this one too. So go ahead, Mary. The media can be your friend on this one. Um, letters to the editor, letters to the superintendent, the school board, um, just getting the word out that this is happening. I mean, public outrage could be your friend. I well, think I, bring ahead, it to other, 
bringing some other voices into the conversation. We had a situation just like this in Maine and the school librarians reached out to their colleagues um, and a few of us spoke to the superintendent and there was a lot, some misunderstanding on his side of how libraries work and how policies work. And sometimes just hearing it from someone then rather than your own library staff can make the difference. I, If you have a, a school system or a library board that has adopted a specific book challenge policy, and or other policies regarding books, and they're not following those policies and the processes, it is actually a, a situation where they can be challenged in court. It is actually illegal for them not to follow their own policies. So there's an opportunity there if it comes to it um, to take action, so. Um, I've got a question from Stephen. Do people on this webinar know about the book defense recommendations being created by the National Council of Teachers of English? I am aware of that. And I know we um, have opportunities for maybe specifically AASL to partner more closely with NCTE. Um, I think it's just another example of how many organizations already exist who do this sort of work. Um, and we certainly need to come together, yeah. Question from Stephen, do people in the panel and the audience know about the website everydayadvocacy.org, which provides strategies and teacher and author stories for defending against book bans and censorship efforts? Mary, you're nodding your head. It's a, it's similar to uh, UABB and also the, the, the book resumes. Uh, it's a very similar um, toolkit and, and resource. It's, it's very good. I've looked at it a couple of times. So. Not recently, no. Okay. Nicole had a question. Is the, is the display policy protected the same as books are protected from banning? And thank you for your time and help. I say, uh, well, yes. And your collection policy should include that. So my collection policy also includes guest speakers. And because, you know, as we've said today, um, libraries aren't just about books. So any kind of material or programming, I think the key word might be programming, that your library will offer should have the same protections. Um, and you may have seen in the news, Greenville County, South Carolina, the Public Library Board has is now probably infamous for banning all displays um, because of a pride display last year. Um, so definitely you wanna include wording for all of your programming. And electronic resources as well. I think one of the uh, the issues too is um, as we think about policies, we have to apply them equitably and across the board. And if you adopt a policy, make sure that you are you are creating the groundwork that everybody receives the same treatment from those policies, whether it's a group you like or not. As long as they're meeting your criteria, they get to use the meeting room. Uh, I'm kind of bouncing around here and not meaning to. Some other questions popped up here. Um, from Mary Leonard, what are the organizations going after these books? Mary, you're smiling. I mean, there, <laughs> um, there's lots. Yeah, in our state, uh, Moms for Liberty is very vocal. Um, they frequently attack librarians as well on social media and in meetings. Um, so that's just one example. Similar, um, you know, conservative, um, they will often have things like freedom and liberty in their names, even though that's not really what they're promoting. But ironically, that's what they call themselves. There's a question here. What about weeding? How do you handle this situation? And I'm assuming that is in uh, regard to uh, how you're managing your collection and, and censorship and book challenges. I would say I wouldn't weed based on 
book challenges that will have a chilling effect on how we're maintaining our collection. I mean, it, for me, it goes back to Ken Cruz and the weeding manual, like looking at your books, are they out of date? Is there misinformation? Are they circulating? There's a variety of other factors that I would use to inform my weeding decisions, not, I wouldn't base it on which around book censorship topics. Sorry, here I'm trying to sort through these uh, questions so we're not duplicating on them. We're actually past our time, but I think we have a few more minutes that we can go. Where have you seen young people speaking up? I'd love to see that. That's a question from Lisa. There's an article about the Girl Scout. Um, she was in Hanover County and she got the gold award for um, creating a band book, a band book club. And then when they gave her the award, they censored what she was doing to get the award. So it was kind of this ironic thing, but she spoke out against it and you could Google it. And then in Caroline County, the students pushed back against, um, and you could Google that too, or Caroline County, Maryland, um, pushed back against efforts to remove certain books from the, their school shelves. Somebody's asking about how we locate the information recommendations being created by the National Council of Teachers of English. As far as I know, their website, um, but I'm not an active member of that organization, so I wouldn't want to say anything else. I believe we have someone on the call from um, NCTE, and we can certainly add that um, reference source in the follow-up materials. Great. We have a couple of questions, one from Kara and one from Nicole about library boards and bad library boards and stacked uh, library boards with extremely conservative folks. Um, it seems like we've covered that, but I, I don't really know how you address that short of education and advocacy and at the ballot box. Any other thoughts on that? Only that I think it is, uh, like I said before, a gray area, and it could be a loophole for efforts, you know, nefarious forces. Uh, and I think it's definitely something maybe that we should um, look at maybe in the policy core. We just, we have very active groups in Greenville County, um, PFLAG and various set organizations like that who they go to all of the meetings and they speak up and they say, you know, you say that you're only banning or removing information that's sexually explicit, but here's the actual list of books you've removed or the displays you don't like um, that don't have sexually explicit material. So that's going to lead one to think that you just don't want my experience represented, which is not what we do in libraries, very, very clearly against everything we do and your constitutional rights. Um, so I think having those groups is really, really important because they can put a face to the story and it's not just some abstract con content, you know, like, oh, of course there shouldn't be anything sexually explicit. Well, of course not. But if that that's obviously not what you're doing. So. I think it's important, too, that we put book challenges and censorship again in the perspective of protecting our democracy and that it's not a partisan issue. And I think in some regards, it's been unfairly painted as a partisan issue um, because uh, it is just not a red or a blue uh, position. It is uh, a position of a group of people that uh, perhaps don't really understand what we're about. And I, th I think that's critical to think about as, as we go through this. Well, it is uh, about 10 after one, and I would like to thank everybody who joined us on this webinar today. Uh, Lainey, maybe you could put up those resource slides very quickly again. Or maybe not. There we go. These are United Against Book Ban resources and ALA resources that we hope you'll take time to visit. 
Uh, the book resumes link is there. Uh, the voter pledge is there. Um, the toolkits for UAB, UABB are there as well. And then from our partners, uh, first book, Study of Positive Impact of Diverse Books, Interfaith Alliance's Information, they're a great collaborator and partner, ALA Adverse Library Legislation Tracker, ACLU informa Information, which is always helpful, and uh, CRT Tracking as well. I'd like to thank everybody who joined us today. I'd like to thank our panelists. They put a lot of time and effort into this as well as doing their day job. And we can't underestimate the value that you guys bring to this. And I'd like to thank Laney and the OIF staff and UABB staff who helped us out as well. Uh, you guys are always great to work with and we appreciate it. And you're doing a tough job uh, 24 hours a day as, as we fight this thing. So thank you all for being with us today and uh, join UABB. Thank you.